What up, Kyle? How you doing, man? Good, man. It's good to be back together. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's been a minute. I know. COVID is the thing. I know. Keeping my distance. The but... last time we did the classroom at Providence. Absolutely. Yeah. That was almost a year ago. It's wild. Indeed, man. I appreciate you coming through for a Bridge Builder conversation. Looking forward to it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Indeed. And I mean, obviously you are a talked about artists, not just here in Charlotte. I mean, I can't go maybe two blocks without seeing some of your work legit, um, but also to see you being covered in magazines and publications that are well known is super dope. Um, you, man. How, how does that make you feel? Do you feel like you've arrived to some degree or are you still climbing? Um, man, it definitely, it feels good. It's, it's validation and, and vindication for a lot of sacrifices and, and hard work. I mean, anybody who's done anything like poetry music art it, it's a lot of kind of you know for my journey it was really five or six seven years of you know bill collectors almost being evicted from every place i was at mm -hmm. like um a lot of struggle and so to be on a, a place where you're being validated for your hard work is something that it'll never get old for sure but in terms of like Arriving, it's like I feel like there's so much more that I that I want to do. Um, sure. But I'm, I'm I feel very grateful to be where I'm at. I feel very blessed, and, and I'm certainly in a place of like ha happiness um, that I get to do what I love. But there's still that tenacious sort of chip on my shoulder of like sure. some, there's something left to prove. And I think that you know having that balance is something that's important. You know, you never want to be complacent. Gotcha. In whatever it is your craft is. That's interesting. Like I intentionally asked you that because you strike me as somebody that doesn't thrive off the accolades and people talking and um, it's interesting, just your perspective. Yeah. In fact, it sounds very sober. It's like, yeah, this is cool, cool, but I'm still going. Yeah. Um, so that's what's up. I think I appreciate that. And I think that you have to go through, if it's given to you, I feel like, the, I don't know, I can't put myself in other people's positions, but I feel like when people sort of seek out that that limelight and stuff mm -hmm. like there's a piece missing within their soul like if you're happy with what you do and you love what you do the accolades will come but they don't define the craft you know gotcha. it's like i still when i create murals like i still look at them and i'm like man i wish i would have done this better this better this sure better. so and as an artist you know you're like you know, no, you're kind of your own worst critic and absolutely. you're like man i wish i would have you know whatever done no. that better so i hear that man i hear that but yo uh very much a part of the DNA of Bridge Builder Conversations is not just talking about what you're doing, um, as I consider you a cultural leader, um, but very much tapping into kind of your origin story and just learning more about who you are as Kyle. And I mean, not Kyle the artist, Kyle the muralist, Kyle the XYZ, mm -hmm. but just who is Kyle. Um, so, I mean, tell me a little bit about yourself, man. Where you from? Yeah. Um, I know you're an 80s baby. We share that in common. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, we, we, we went through, man, we were very blessed with music, man. We went through so many good, like, genres. Like, I feel, I feel like, you know, obviously the 60s and 70s had, had their share. But, sure. man, I think, like, the 80s and 90s, we had, we had some good music. But, we did, man. Um, I'm originally from Canada. Hey. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yup. Far, far from home down here, so. man. Um, originally from Canada and then grew up in New England. I would live... Uh, in Canada in the summers mm -hmm. uh, with my grandparents and then did like my background is not to get too much deviated but I played hockey which is like the, the big thing that people do in Canada oh, so I was groomed at a very young age to, to do the hockey thing Mighty and, uh, Ducks yeah man I, grew up, that's, Look, I remember seeing that in the theaters too man yeah um, that was on repeat on the v VHS man oh man Mighty Ducks it's, it was and looking back to again we were so blessed man I was like man I get to live through that you for know? sure like I remember seeing all that stuff in the stores and like and I, I, wanted, I like, remember they started coming out with like the TV show and the action figures um, yeah so that was um a big part of my DNA was the sports kind of like hockey background and nope. then um, and then that's all I did really until I was in my early 20s and um, you know I wherever we want to take this but yeah I the, the the thing that kind of the catalyst for me for for the art thing was I had always been creative mm -hmm. growing up like it was always inside of me to want to express myself through poetry or music or art uh, but it was never like a thing that was 
encouraged really or gotcha. ever really thought of as like an actual career mm-hmm. um so it was like the hockey thing was always like where my mind was at but when i was 20 21 somewhere in there like i just dropped out of school like i no was going to a, uh, a college college to play hockey and that was what i was doing and i was like man this is just not for me and um I dropped out. It's hmm. just like I'm done. I didn't tell my parents either. Oh, all right. So you were serious about it. You were playing hockey in college. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up playing ball, playing basketball. Um, so I understand the whole sports and legit being consumed with it. Like my family, we played ball yeah. from my my uncles to my like I'm the next to the youngest. So my sister played ball. My older brother played ball. I played ball. My younger brother. All of us play ball, um, and I, I remember telling my younger brother, "It's like, yo, you, you're supposed to be the best one oh, because yeah. all of us gone through it, and you should be learning." You know what I mean? Um, we had like a hoop in the backyard, and uh, yeah, used to yam on it. It wasn't ten feet; it was like a, a yeah, yeah. maybe eight feet. So we used to always dunk on that joint. Um, so when he was younger and getting beat up and, and dunked on. He's like, bro, you should be the yeah. best out of all of us by the time we're done with you. And I mean, and legit, he, he is. Um, so how about you, sibling-wise? Are you I, only child? What? Only child, man. Oh, wow. But I grew up, it's funny, because, like, the people I grew up around were all, like, hockey was so uncool in my neighborhood. Yeah, man, because, well, because I would live in the States. Ah, okay. Like, Got uh, you. Yeah. So not in Canada. Yeah. Okay. So, so like, I remember going to Canada and it was like in the summer times and I would play with all my, my friends up there and do all the camps and everything and mm-hmm. um, man it was like life but then I came down and it was like opposite man it was like my, my whole friend group uh, in the states was all mm-hmm. basketball and I was so uh, bad man. I was easily the worst one right but I would like you know when you run and dribble like you can't wrap <laughs> hold on hold on like, even, even the way you did that bro, Kyle you know, you know hold on about? Like, like you can't wrap you like a baby deer on ice when you kind of like yes you I look like a baby deer right no, now so God. I would run and I would run and dribble because I couldn't grasp the fact that like my feet don't move when the got you. <laughs> wow so I was that bad man I was always Dang. last pick that's a good example <laughs> like a deer on ice for real you just yeah. look like a deer on ice that's I'm hilarious yo. Pick, people were like <laughs> <laughs> were you the last one pick always always, uh, no. always I'd be on the on the on the um on the brick wall and I'd be like oh man here we go like I'm gonna be just <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not laughing at you no you should it should man it should be laughed at man I was, I Yo. was really truly bad but this is what I, this is what happened is I developed really good like I never wanted anyone to pass me the ball because yeah. I always wanted to play defense ah, that's see? where I was there like you know, I would just like be really good at there you go. coordination and just defending so like, you're like the white Dennis Rodman yeah alright man. got you yeah. alright that hey you can make up for that that deer prancing with the ball yeah, that with your defense. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, man. Wow. Yeah. So Good that stuff. was um. So I it was it was funny because that that was like I had almost like two different existences. Like going, uh, was, interesting. Like, the like I grew up in like an inner city in the United States, mm-hmm. and in Canada it was like hyper farm like my grandparents were farmers uh, so i was on a farm doing the farm thing like i'd wake up in the morning and do all the chores you know clean out the the, the animal stalls and mm-hmm. like you know like learned how to drive a tractor like that mm-hmm. that stuff and then like canadian farm is different than like american like you know like the so? culture is it's just different it's like more rooted in like i don't know it, it's um like it's hard to explain i, I guess i maybe more so where I grew up, I guess, from my, my grand- grandparents being farmers, like, like my my grandfather was really into music, like played harmonica and mm-hmm. like guitar, piano. So he always had that stuff laying around. Gotcha. So it felt less like of like um, I don't even know. It, it felt less rooted in like guns, Confederate flag, and more rooted in just like guns and music and like just a different vibe so the cultural kind of upbringing and that was, was much different um and then like in the states i grew up and i was in like an inner city so like it was you know like a, a whole different thing so i feel very blessed that i got to kind of experience so much like culturally mm-hmm. at a very early age got you describe more and again you're talking about growing up in two worlds um, again, I understand that as well. Like my life before Charlotte 2001 was totally different prior um, to coming here. 
So I'm interested for you when you say like two different worlds, and again, you kind of said some of what it is. Yeah. Like on a Canadian farm and being on in the inner city, I'm interested. What was that like, and what what was different about that culturally, even I don't know racially, yeah. was that more diverse for you, and what, just what was that experience yeah. like? Well, in the states, I was like the I was there was only two white dudes in our friend group in our neighborhood, uh, so it was like you were the white guy. I was man. Hey, was so like <laughs> the other dude was like uh, super like. Like listen to corn, gothy kind of hardcore kid, like mm -hmm. and um, and you know he was he was cool with all of us, like gotcha. but he kind of did his own thing and and he was kind of on the peripheries, um, but then like for me it was like I had you know three this was like again the biggest blessing ever and we'll talk about you know when nine eleven happened but I had three Muslim brothers that were from Tunisia that were my friends mm -hmm. so it was like getting to experience the Muslim culture and you know before 9-11 happened and if you're old gotcha. enough to remember it's like when that happened it was like uh, there was an immediate shift and sure. divide like sure. where you know um, unfortunately a lot of the Muslim culture got so much of the brunt of that you know sure. and, and I saw firsthand kind of like what they had to go through you know and, gotcha. and so and then I had like a huge like uh, like Caribbean and Dominican population mm -hmm. so like getting to experience like a lot of the food and cultures and like you know like going into my friend's house and like friends and they always have like plastic on their couches and there'd be like jesus everywhere and mm -hmm. like i grew up not like believing in anything like i was gotcha. never tied to it so like i learned a lot about you know sort of like this the religious undertones of stuff through through from through those kind of my dominican friends and kind of like being exposed to a lot of different people at a very young age the other thing too that i discovered really early was like my love for Indian food gotcha. is something that was like, you know, I feel like if you're not, that's kind of a foreign thing, you know, if you, if you grew up, at mm -hmm. a, like, the, 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 like all the spices and the smells sure. like, but man, I was like, I remember my friend was like, his mom used to roll up the balls, mm -hmm. like these rice balls, and okay. then it would just be like rice dipped curry balls. And I was like, man, like this, this shit was, yeah, it was life changing, <laughs> man. But I was just really blessed to get to, experienced that at such a young age like I feel that. from you know really elementary all the way through middle school to early parts of junior high I mean all the early parts of high school that was like got you that interesting going back and forth was but then I'd go to the farm and have like big like roasts or like big pot pots of like um, like beef stew and like really hearty meals mm -hmm. right so like just from a food aspect like there's two different sort of things going on there no, I um, see that. my grandfather um towards the end of towards the end of like what he got later in life he didn't slaughter his own cows but like everything would be fresh and homegrown like farm-based meals so like from just from a food perspective mm -hmm. that was obviously a huge difference and from a sports pr perspective it was hockey versus basketball, basketball. Um, gotcha so those were the two big main differences and obviously being in canada all my friends were white gotcha. so it was like i had just such a drastic upbringing you know where i would spend three or four months around white kids and then three or four where i was the only white kid you know in my neighborhood interesting i guess when you talk about that again you you pick out basketball hockey um farm city like when you talk about canada being all white and then your diverse friend group um, in the states how how did you or i mean and i actually how old were you when you're doing this back and forth oh it started at elementary school so okay. i mean my, my from you know really first grade on but the oh, the hockey basketball thing didn't really become like uh or like more of the being aware of cultural differences didn't mm -hmm. really become a thing until I, like sixth grade oh, and i remember sixth okay. grade because like that's when like I got my first pair of Jenkos and like my first pair of Jordans. Jankos. Like, yeah, man. So like, and I had both of my ears pierced. That's man, funny. So, like, oh no. And I remember like. I remember that. That's when I remember culturally things being different, you know, because then I would go to Canada and like my grandparents were just like, "What? How did you navigate that?" Oh, I mean, it was challenging, you know. And then now, I mean all the way up until now like I don't speak to my family anymore so I don't have any communication with them but I mean I have like a full sleeve now and a nose ring and I got like a tattoo oh so that that's not a family approved oh for sure no, got no, you not at all I mean a lot of the decisions I made in life were just not family approved so but 
I think that's an important sort of crossroads where you, you know, you sort of realize um, loving yourself is really important mm -hmm. and, and knowing who you are and the direction you want to head in life. And then you ask yourself, like, obviously family's blood, but it doesn't always mean to have have the have the, your best intentions at mind, you know. And mm -hmm. it could be because of like their own sort of inner demons that they have. And so, you know, having to make that decision was like, you know, I love myself and I love what I do. And I love them, but from afar, from a periphery standpoint. And gotcha. I can't let that energy change or affect who I am because I know how much I have to give to this world sure. um, through art and through my platform and just just sort of like through the love that I have to give. And I can't let, let that affect me, you know? And, and all you can do is sort of, again, love from afar and, and hope that they understand that even though what I'm doing is very different, mm -hmm. um, that it's a viable thing, number one, you can make money making art and it's an important thing and it pushes, art can very much, or whatever your platform is, you can move the needle forward through, um, you know, whether it be changing people's negative opinions or you you know changing the world or however you want to put it you can mm -hmm. move the needle forward just by being your authentic true self and that's all i've ever all i've ever mm -hmm. wanted to do from day one what what age was that turning point for you where you realized that hey this is who i am who i want to be and it doesn't necessarily again job a click with yeah. how i've been raised or my family uh so 2021 somewhere 2021? In oh, between wow. 1921 is when i um, I started reading a lot of books, man. I just really was into reading. I read a lot of like design art books and like, I remember everyone asked me like, what do, like my family, like, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? You know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I had no answers to that because I was afraid to say, I want to do music or I want to do art. Gotcha. You know, like it was just something that I knew right away would be, I was protecting my energy. So mm -hmm. if you vocalize that to negative people, they're going to gotcha. just immediately smother it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to protect, protect. Uh, protect my energy and protect yes. what I loved and I just knew that that they wouldn't understand so I was always internalizing like and kind of like reading a ton of books reading 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 and I was just like man the, the, the thing I need to do is is um really go to an art school hmm. and that's where you're going to get a lot of the meat potatoes of like color theory and design and composition and um so I dropped out I hmm. quit hockey dropped out and, and I took a community college drawing class I'd never outside of just like what you do in high school I'd never done an art class and then gotcha. but I was always really creative I mean again in sixth grade me and my friends would like design our own Jordans we would draw and the, you know we would uh, design our own Jankos and like we would figure out patterns that we wanted to use on, on like you know so we would find like patterns and we were just doing a lot of like creative stuff like gotcha. for kids that were you know in sixth grade and I just remember that being like big part of my early love for like fashion art hmm. design gotcha yeah well, what would you say i'm interested what is your family's i guess trade what is the approved right. lane when it comes to your family traditional is it farming yeah farming? i don't know <laughs> yeah no my dad was the first i mean i'm i'm really the first one who didn't farm oh, i mean I, I like i um i drove a tractor that's how i learned how to drive like a stick shift was gotcha. a tractor right so then i i learned like i you know i was in horse shows and stuff when i was really really young i remember that but i just remember it being like you know this is not for me like uh. and, but my dad was like you know my dad was really the last one to do it up until he was however old he was and then he he walked away from it but you'd, oh, really? you'd think that like him walking away he would understand me walking away you know it's so, not that's not the case yeah or I don't know, man. That's a whole different, uh, a whole different conversation. But he, um, he was a car dealer, and I think the, you know, for him being fiscally conservative and like traditional ways of making money were kind of like. But what was wild is like, you know, we grew up in the internet boom era, right? Where mm -hmm. like, you know, we had AOL and dial-up and stuff. So like, there were websites were first being made. Like, I remember being obsessed with figuring out how to make a website. Like that, that to me gotcha. was so wild. Like and like now you have Squarespace you go on and it's just sure. already built but I was coding and I would have to go to like the library and find like books on and I remember when eBay first came around that's what started my love for like flipping sneakers or gotcha. you know kind of doing a lot of this entrepreneurial stuff like, gotcha. but it was all rooted in this new boom of internet technology and hmm. that's was really what the plot like the 
the early initial stage was from my love for kind of being an entrepreneur and, and gotcha. building out my own things and was was through like building websites and flipping sneakers and stuff like that. Gotcha. Uh, that's interesting, man. Um, and I understand, how would I say, the, the dynamic as well as the tension involved in, again, just difference yeah. in general, but also, uh, how would I say, the, the tension and the very unique tension when it comes to difference within a family structure, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and some of it, I believe, I even venture to say the majority of it is, can be well-meaning, it's like, hey, I've done X, Y, Z, and this is what will be good for you, but right. at the same time, something I try to position myself always is is acknowledging the reality that there's so much you don't know yeah. and so much to be learned, you know what I mean? Um, and with anyone who doesn't, who isn't positioning themselves in that way, that automatically equals rub oh. all day, you know what I mean? Just because there's something that you don't know and I would say the inability to to open oneself up to maybe there's something else, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, I, I wholeheartedly understand that, and even on the family tip, it's like yeah, I, I, I know what you, I know yeah, where you yeah. at, I know where you at. We, should, we, we could have a whole different sure. episode on, on that for sure, which could be uh, interesting too, because I think you know a lot of people would benefit here from that. You know, it's like family is this sort of almost like prison of like this is how you do things right and you mm -hmm. never want to disappoint your family so people mm -hmm. get locked into this sort of thing and, and they you know they lose the magic of being themselves you mm -hmm. know and you see that with people who want to be artists or musicians like, sure or, or whatever maybe. Mm -hmm. like we live in a time now where you can literally be anything sure you, know, you can be a professional streamer or gamer right and sure that like if i had a um, like a child and he was like yo I want to game my whole life like growing up video games were bad and now you're like man this kid could probably make way more money than I could like streaming on Twitch or you know like yeah so no doubt the business models have changed you know sure and they're gonna continue that's just you know that's just life so even that's interesting and again maybe you can talk about your experience here but I think about my own upbringing and I would say definitely a lot of this is in retrospect the the desire to connect on a deeper level yeah. with parental figures and even amongst siblings, you know what I mean, for me. And I'll just say the inability to, um, for various reasons, in a lot of ways is generational to where my mom and dad don't know how to do this because they didn't have that for themselves. So it's like just repeating of the generation, which to me, I, again, I try my best not to hold that against them and just understand that. But at the same time, it's in like with me having two girls now is the idea of okay how do I again position myself in a way where I can learn along with them yeah. and it sounds weird it's like I mean no, I no. got an eight and a nine year old like learn and again this is within the typical structure yeah, of yeah. I'm the adult you're the child but it's like yo just sitting down with my daughters and hearing how their school they went the random stuff that's going through their head yeah. um, like I have a daughter that's super she sings all throughout the day. She's always talking. And I have to check myself around. You could either do the typical parent and be like, be quiet, shut up, yeah. sit down, X, Y, Z, fit in this box. Or you could engage her around yeah. what she enjoys. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's and, profound, man. And legit is like, it's not just, and this is the parts where you have, you look back at your upbringing like, man, I wish I had that. Yeah. It was like, I wish I had oh. somebody who was willing to hear where I was at at various times because kids it changes every day but like was there to um, not just entertain but just listen as a human being and invest mm -hmm. in whatever way they could yep. throughout um, even when I say this it sounds weird but throughout all of the phases yeah. you know what I mean and just what that can communicate to a child you know what I mean yep. um, so I, I very much understand and I understand the I would say the I would say the disappointment, you know what I mean? It's like, man, yeah. what if sure. my family, what if my parents were open and engaged me and supported me sure. earlier? Where might I be today, you know what I mean? But you might not 
it might be a negative too. Because so too absolutely much, too much. I agree. Support is like coddling and. There's like, you know, you, you almost become... I wouldn't even call that, I wouldn't, wouldn't even call that love and support, though. Yeah. I would call it, that's, that's unhealthy. Oh, that's yeah, not yeah. even love, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I totally get what you're saying, though. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I think that uh, the direction that you're heading as a parent is, my favorite saying is, one of my favorite sayings is like, parents will let their kids be anything but themselves, you know? like hmm. And so the fact that you have... Uh, what you said was amazing where it's like you're at this cross point where it's like do I put her in a box and say you can't do these things sure or you're just like sing louder you know sure. dance louder or like, sure. you know whatever louder and then really unlocking that sort of uh, um, that inner fire that she has because mm -hmm. you know yeah. I think I'm like the trajectory for kids who who kind of have what I've had to experience is usually most likely negative right you're perpetuating the cycle of abuse unhappiness so you end up in dark negative places doing dark negative things so mm -hmm. i feel incredibly fortunate and blessed that i was able to break that right, so. but that's not usually the story sure you know? like and um so like you know, one of my favorite things is, t is talking to kids like you know is, is and i think teaching them two things is one you can literally be anything, mm -hmm. but the important other half of that is like, it's not easy. So like preparing them for the realities of, sure. like, which is why I like, um, you know, having these discussions because you see them light up because I never had that. And, gotcha. You know, it sounds sure. like you, you didn't either, right? When you, someone can tell you like, hey, what you, if you want a game, if you want to be a poet, a musician, whatever, like mm -hmm. you can do that. And to, they get so empowered by that, they light up and their energy changes. and. Um, hmm. And, but then in the, again, I like the yeah, like I kind of dropped the hammer and be like, it's gonna be hard. like <laughs> right. I, I had to sleep in my car. I was almost homeless. Like I've been almost evicted. Like I had zero financial support from any emotional financial, any support from anybody really in my family in the early part of what I was doing. So you have to love and believe so much that it transcends all of the hardships. Mm -hmm. And then once you sort of push through and you get to that point, then you kind of have an obligation to give back to kids or to whoever. Mm -hmm. to like, that's why I, I started mentoring Christian. I don't know if you, did, was Christian there? Christian. He was the, the dude, the, the cinematographer that I have now. I think he was there filming for the... I don't, I don't think so. So this is a great transition, though, yeah. to talk about um, pretty much... <laughs> I was invited to be a part of Capstone Project at Providence yeah. Day. Um, and kind of the... Yeah, again, you know this. It, was, it all revolved around... The Capstone Project revolved around uh, diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Um, and I shared my story of my whole life, corner to the cul-de-sac. And um, again, this Providence Day, private school... Yeah. It's like going to college when it comes to money. It costs a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and an uh, important part of me sharing my story amongst majority, I mean, they have a diverse body of students, but it's very much affluent yeah. like, culturally. Um, and I had to share with them specifically, again, you talk about coming from the hood, black cultural experience, and then this idea of, okay, I, I moved to Charlotte and things, I was open up to new things and my life changed in some significant ways and yeah. some good ways. I think most times we can look at that like, oh, Charlotte saved you, the white right. community. It's like, no, yeah. that's not the case. And even as I hear you talk about, again, sing loud or dance, you know, yeah. and things of that nature, is the idea that we all, and the way I see it is we all have an innate value. Yeah. You know what I mean? What that is, what your journey is, is different. I can't call it for you. I right. can't call it for my daughters. Right. But I think my, my role, and I think our role in, I'll call it obligation, and I, what I hope and how we treat one another is that we would help unlock those things and yeah. give space for those things to flourish, not lock them down, yeah. close doors, you know what I mean? And, and to me, that, that requires a certain degree of humility yeah. as well as uh, openness mm. to what you don't know. So with the Providence Day kids, I was like, yo, 
I innately have value, whether I'm in Charlotte or not. Yeah. You innately have value, whether you're in Charlotte or not, whether you're in a affluent family, whether you're on this side of town, west, north, south, whatever side of town you're, there's value in each and every one of us. Yeah. And the question is, how are we limiting our exposure to that difference in value? Yeah, you know what I mean? For sure. Um, Cause, and I showed them like my first music video, which was in my my um, my neighborhood, Huntersville. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, look at this kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Look at this kid. You know what I mean? Got my super bubble army jacket with the fur around the hood. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, again, you may look at that and be like, oh, you know, I want to give some money to him. You know what yeah. I mean? Let's donate some funds, get him some shoes. Like, yeah. no, look, where I'm from has built me in a certain way. Yep that you have not been. Mm -hmm. And there's value in that, just like where you're from yeah. and what you know, there's value. The question becomes, are we content with staying in our silos? Yeah. Or are we willing to break outside of that to engage with that value, if we believe it? Because yeah. I think that's also a thing, we may not believe that, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so when we brought, brought you in and I invited you to speak to the kids, it was interesting because when we were on the phone, it sounded like you didn't want to do it. I just, or, I just, my <laughs> thing with kids is like, Man, I'm very, I don't feel like I am the right person to, to touch people's lives because I feel so flawed as a human being that I'm like, man, I don't, I'm speaking of value, gotcha. I, man, I, I barely graduated high school. Like I've made every mistake along the way. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, if anything, I've had so many failures. So my value was like, I don't want to taint these kids gotcha. with my interest. But then I realized as I as I continue to talk to students and kids more, there's value in the negativity. There's mm -hmm. value in telling people that, hey, listen, like, you know, I, you know, there was times where I had to sleep on people's couches. There was times where I like I had to eat out of vending machines. Like I had mm -hmm. to look for change. Like there was value in all that. Like I learned so much about what I was able to handle and mm -hmm. in life and stuff that I used to be like ashamed of became, you know, like things that I became most proud of. So, you know, it's always a touchy subject for me talking to kids, but I'm getting better at it because I don't want to, I don't want to like ruin their development because I feel like my development was ruined as a, as a, as a child. Gotcha. So like, I'm very sensitive to like, you know, but I f see, that's even interesting, man. Yeah. And I, I understand that dynamic. So definitely not belittling yeah, it, yeah, but yeah. I think, even that thought is conditioned by the idea of there's a perfect way to be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Thus, I'm not qualified yeah. to talk to anybody. So I feel like even that thought or that train of thought is something that does not help us. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I would say, again, when you talk about generational, that's just something that, yeah, this is the way you have to be. This exactly. is the way you have to be. And you have kids who are internalizing yeah. that. And at your age, still internalizing and having to grapple with right. that. Um, so I... Yeah, that's, again, that's just, that's screwed up. And Growing up, my biggest insecurity was family. Because I knew that I would go to my friend's house mm -hmm. and they would have, like, a family structure. And I didn't have that, so I always felt less than. So, like, uh, that's why kids and family were always, like, my biggest sort of, like, insecurity. And, and gotcha. why, as I get older now, it's like, man, I really want to change the generational curse of having sort of, like, you know, this, this... <laughs> Obviously, there's no way to have a perfect family, sure. but just be more self-aware, more em empathetic, more caring, more open to, you know, a lot of different things. But specifically, uh, as it relates to to the family dynamic. Got you. So your mom and pops weren't together. Mm -mm. You're okay. So funny, you flip it on the head, just to give you a different perspective. So my mom and pops were together mm. when um, in my time during high school, yeah. and I mean up until high school and. In retrospect, looking back, it's, again, I very much appreciate it and I, I believe that was important. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just the presence sure. of them being in the same house. But at the same time, and again, the majority of my friends who we knew, they didn't. They yeah. had single family homes. So for us, or at least for me, it was like, you know, I'm glad we have both of our parents. You know what I mean? That's a good thing, X, yeah. Y, Z. And it was. But at the same time, I, in retrospect, look back like, man, there was a lot of negative aspects to that of as course, well, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's not family structure wasn't the issue. It was just the fact that people are flawed. Yeah. People are screwed up, you know what I mean? Yeah, and when course. you put people with people, it's yeah. like, how does that mm -hmm. compound, you know what I mean? So for me growing up, again, I love, again, having my mom, having my pops in the house. But 
there's definitely a tension of, I think there's always a hope of how could it be better, right. you know what yeah. I mean? As well as how equipped were they to even be in the same house together and raise kids, you know what I mean? So you get into, it's just a rabbit yeah. trail and I, so all that being said is like, I just try to see people as people yeah. and people form unions or sure. form systems X, Y, Z, but at the base level is like people are people. and based on their health, yeah. mentally, spiritually, physically, they produce what they produce, yeah. you know what I mean? So you could have two parents together, but mad unhealthy yeah. is like, is no better than honestly not even having parents. Right. So again, yeah. it's not to belittle no, 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 your no. journey or even mine, because again, I appreciate my right. parents and what they Some were able to do. Some people could have a completely healthy upbringing, you know, in, in, a, in a one or zero parent home, maybe even being raised by uh, grandparents, aunts and uncles, like sure. that, you're dead on. There's no right way to do it. And there's always a healthy, there's basically it comes down to it's healthy and unhealthy. It Absolutely. doesn't not matter what the structure Absolutely. is. Absolutely. For me, it was just like, you know, I just was really, I going over to friend's house and eat dinner and seeing two parents, it just like, it made me feel less than. So I was mm -hmm. like, man, like I don't, which kind of, again, transcends, transcends to your question you asked about talking to kids. It's like, I felt less than when I was in a family structure and then I felt less than talking to kids. But I've since broken that. Gotcha. That's obviously a negative uh, and thing that you've inherited mm -hmm. through as growing up. So now I'm like, I love talking to kids now and I love doing yeah. the stuff like that, man, because, you know, like I can, I feel like the value I have, I understand my value and I understand mm -hmm. my platform and the importance of not just creating the art and moving people through what I create, mm -hmm. but also moving people with empowerment. No, it's dope, man. So, more about your art, and we've kind of, I gave you a call, and we talked about this a little bit. Yeah. And again, your murals are here, there, everywhere throughout the city, um, and obviously your, your, your reach is way beyond the city of Charlotte as well. Um, but what, what really intrigued me last year, all things COVID, but also um, post the murder of George Floyd, in the echoes or ripples across the world when it comes to social justice, yeah. racial issues, and things of that, it, of that nature. Seeing you be a part of um, exhibits and conversations through art that were hitting on topics of race, inequality, um, discrimination, justice, was interesting for me to, to watch because again, as a white guy, yeah. I'm always interested in, okay, what brings somebody to the sure. point to where they're willing to advocate, they're willing to speak up about things that may not directly impact them yeah. because of their color of skin or whatever it may be. Um, so with the guys and, and, and the ladies at, uh, at Black Market, yeah. so you're very tight and involved with them and good to see you, again, shouting them out um, on social and things of that nature, but you involved as an artist as well yeah. in those exhibits. Tell me or share with me how, what has that journey been, just in relationship with them? Yeah. Um, and not just them, just artists of different races, ethnicities, cultures. How is it engaging with them as well as last year? Sure. What brought you to be involved in exhibits like Off the Plantation? Yeah. I mean, that starts... It's such a, we could have an entire podcast on the psychology of mm -hmm. how deep those roots run. But again, mm -hmm. it started being in elementary school and growing up around people who didn't look like me. Mm -hmm. So like I say this to when I talk to class, when this discussion comes up, it's like, I'm never going to know what it's like to be a woman or gay mm -hmm. or black or Muslim. Like I'm mm -hmm. white, straight. I'm everything but Christian basically, right? Gotcha. So I check all of those boxes. and. <laughs> And growing up, like, when we talk about things that happened, you know, prior to or post 9-11 and seeing how my friends who were Muslim were treated, right? And mm -hmm. then, you know, like, I remember going to the corner store with my friends, being the only white dude, and then how that dynamic changed when I went with, by myself, you know? Uh, Just being, like, you know, followed around, gotcha. right? And then going by myself, and then, so like, I didn't know any of these buzzwords that are floating around sure. now, like privilege and stuff. I just knew that there was a dynamic that was different. So sure. I feel so 
blessed to be put in a position where I got to experience, like not under, not, I don't know what it's like, but I got to see what that looked like. And, mm -hmm. you know, just like, and this I, was early on in life. So, yeah, I didn't okay. even know. Like that was my. You couldn't goal. call it, but you knew it was it was the difference. Right, and it, I didn't call it until, which we'll get to how this the catalyst for all of these shows and, mm -hmm. and the Black Lives Matter mural happened. But I just remember um, being like, man, there's a difference mm -hmm. on how we are being treated. Like, sure. and um, I think one of my f things that I loved about myself was I was very introspective and very like just socially aware of things mm -hmm. because of being introspective. Like I was more quiet and I like to watch and notice and, gotcha. and analyze things. So like um, just being aware of that when I was young and then fast forward, like that was a thing that just was always around me, right? And mm -hmm. then the psychology to get deeper is like because my home life was very volatile, like um, and my family life was, I felt unwanted by my family. I felt more comfortable around, this is where it gets Interesting. black uh, people, okay. because I felt like I was just, it felt just, that was my normal. Mm -hmm. So then as I got older, I didn't realize until, I mean, really, probably six or seven, eight years ago when I started having conversations with Dammit Wesley mm -hmm. about things like privilege and about things like, you know, the buzzword of being a culture vulture, right? Like things gotcha. like that where I was like, man, like I have all of these things that I gained from being a part of black culture, but none of the negatives. Mm -hmm. So that's where Wesley and I opened up conversation about like, you know, how, but that was my normal. Like it was gotcha. like, this is just what I knew. So mm -hmm. wanting to move the needle forward in a positive way, but in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. the, the last thing I wanted to be was like a flag bearer, like being like, I'm here to change the world because that's <laughs> inauthentic in itself. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like anyone who approaches things from a savior perspective, savior perspective yeah. it's just inauthentic. Like, what do you, I'm always skeptical because I'm like, what are you seeking to profit from this, mm -hmm. right? Like, what is it you gain? But for me, it was more just like, again, one of the best conversations I had was with Ohavia too about this. And that was a really profound conversation because I, you know. oh. Yeah, <laughs> she's she's amazing, man. Like, what, what was that conversation? Oh, I was just straight up. Like we, we she used to we used to see each other out all the time at like different mm -hmm. things, and I was like, how can I use my art as a as a platform in a, in, a, in a way that's authentic, in a way that doesn't come across as profiteering or whatever? And, gotcha. and she was like, I love having conversations with Ohavia and Dammit Wesley because like it's always real it's mm -hmm. never there's never any sort of like they just cut right through it sure and we've built a relationship where they can be real with me sure. and they know Absolutely. that like i'm not here to like do anything in a negative way there's safety there yeah for sure. sure from both from both sides too sure. which is great because i when you have a conversation with people you're comfortable with the purest form of love is them telling you negative things about yourself or them telling them because then you're receiving it from a point of love, sure. but then you're able to change from a point of love, as uh -huh. opposed to changing from a point of spitefulness or whatever. But it was never uh, yeah. like that. It was always positive from, from day one with both of them. And I remember prior to George Floyd being murdered. Oh, having, hold on, hold on real quick before you go there. Yeah, yeah. I'm just interested in, as you talk about being introspective yeah. and asking questions, I feel like, and again, when I think about uh, whether they're white friends or colleagues or leaders that I um, have relationships with, yeah. I think one of the biggest issues that they either talk with me about or don't talk with me right. about is their fear to ask questions, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and in a lot of ways, is the fear is because they don't want to offend or yeah. they don't want to X, Y, Z, and so I understand that at a level, but at the same time, it's like, yo, if you don't, one, I believe you do need to do your own research. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Use Google. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Do your own research. But at the same time, and a big part of this conversation is the fact that, yo, you do need proximity to difference. Yeah. And you need to be able to create a safe space where there's trust that takes time. You sure. know what I mean? Where you can have authentic conversation and questioning for the benefit yeah. of you both. You know right. what I mean? Because I, I would say... Again, I can't speak for them, but just the fact that you would ask, oh, or Damon Wesley, right. a vulnerable question like that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I believe that that is, that is the recipe to continued building of trust, you sure, know what I mean? Yeah. Because if anything, and I'll speak for myself as a black man, it's like, yo, 
if I don't even know you, yeah. or I don't trust you, sure. Hey, I'm not sure I even want to have this conversation. Of course, with you, yeah. know what I mean, yeah. Just based it takes on some vulnerability from both parties too, you know. Absolutely. Or, and the thing about him and I is, we had built a relationship far prior. So mm-hmm. when I first moved here, he was one of the first people I ever met just by bopping around to like our uh, galleries. Got you. So, don't. so I remember being on his podcast. So how many years have y'all known each other? Probably eight years now. Eight years, all right. Yeah. There we go. So, um, seven, eight, somewhere in that range. So not not eight hours before you asked him. No, no, eight years. What is it like to be a black man? Right, 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 right. Yeah, (laughs) no, it was like, yeah, at at that point, you're sort of just like, you might as well just like open up the the business of awkwardness and and whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where a lot of like, um, and again, if you don't know me, right the questions being asked are like why are you asking these questions sure. right? which is why i think like prefacing it with like my experience was like i've always just been the white dude <laughs> like, sure. like and that's kind of just been like I mean, being, being able to get to know you helps me understand oh oh okay he's yeah. probably coming from xy and again without asking right. you directly sure. it's assumptions but at the same time being able to know that about you helps fill in some right. some blanks, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. okay, all right, cool. So, so that's why he shows up like that. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's why he got the J. Oh, I get it. <laughs> I get it. It was like, that was my upbringing, you know? Sure. Like, so, and and again, as I got older, asking questions is like, the, the, the thing that was made most aware of me through conversations with O'Havy and Dan West, they were like, you know, all of the positives that you experience from being around black culture, but you have none of the negative experience, mm-hmm. right? So that was such a, it, again, like, that was my normal. But hearing that, I was like, fuck, man. Like, and mm-hmm. I have another, when we did the off the plantation thing, you know, which we can get into, because that's, yeah. that to me was so, so, so important. And um, I had so many difficult conversations with white and black people, right? And that that is so important to, how I want to use art as a platform to mm-hmm. experience things. Like I want, you know, we'll we'll get back to that. But but going back to the conversation that I had with O'Havy and Damon Wesley was, you know, that was the catalyst to the show. And prior to, I mean, Dan Wesley called me up and he was like, "We're doing the Black Lives Matter mural. Do you want to be a part of that?" That's how that was just cut and dry. And he no. just reached out to me and and I, and I did that. And and um, that was like obviously incredibly humbling and amazing but how, how did you i'm going back to you getting calls about stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. how did you internalize even that ass you know right. what i mean of course by that time you're within you have a good relationship with them sure. you know what i mean he calls you about this and again this is a black lives matter mural right during again very tense time in our country in our city xyz yeah. what goes to your mind before you say yes to that um I mean, to be honest, it was just, it was a very easy yes. And and that's, there are times where there's things where I question things and I'm like, should I be a part of this? And Mm -hmm. I'll be the first to admit that because we'll talk about that again for the off the plantation thing, Mm -hmm. right? Because I was like, yo, I I can, I'm not being a part of this. (laughs) Like, and, and, but for this, I was a very easy yes. Because I was just like, I, I think I was like, this is a thing where we can really keep the conversation moving. Like, and I, one of the biggest pushbacks I heard is like, it's just a mural, how are you changing things? But it's like, mm-hmm. we got it in every single person's mouth and mm-hmm. within 24 hours of it creating it, Chris Brown and LeBron James retweeted it. Mm-hmm. So that's how we're moving the needle forward. Like mm-hmm. me going and standing in front of people and, and pretending like I'm a politician or, I'm never gonna change people's minds. Sure. And that's inauthentic of me. But gotcha. what's authentic for me is I create art. I love it. I'm gonna be an artist till the day I die. I'm gonna create and express myself through art and fashion till the day I die, like that platform of creating art and that's authentic to me. So that's how I move the needle forward. Now, if he was to ask me to like, I don't know, like do anything else, I would be the first to be like, this This may be inauthentic. Like, I don't mm-hmm. feel like I can speak from a place of authenticity and, and tell my story, but also be myself if I'm put in a position anywhere outside the realm of art and mm-hmm. fashion and, and th- that in that realm, because that's who I am and how I want to change things. So. Um, yeah, the conversation was, do you want to be a part of this? We have 72 hours to, in, from the inception of creating our uh, art up until the application of the art was three days. And, hmm. and then, then obviously the, the rest is sort of history. But being a part of that was, was uh, just one of the most 
humbling experiences of my life because we started it with like you know volunteers mm -hmm. and by noon we had national media there i mean like everyone was there like mm -hmm. people with, with microphones and asking questions and volunteers and i mean the entire experience there was not one single person in that realm of on tryon street that was there for a ne for a negative reason everybody was there because they were they knew that they were witnessing history you know mm -hmm. and, um so it was a, a powerful movement and and seeing people bring their kids and, and teaching them sure. like that that to me again my sensitivity with children and i was like man now i know i'm a part of something that's like mm -hmm. really special so that was really touching no, that's dope man so off the plantation uh for like let's peel back the layers yeah. there um was it as easy to say yes to that i mean or was that kind of a brainchild that you worked on with i don't yeah. know how I, did I, that come about so i had a solo show which I've never had in my life, planned oh, wow. for at Elder Gallery. We were gonna do something. Uh, Sonia, the owner of Elder Gallery, mm -hmm. uh, her and her husband are, are uh, civil rights attorneys. So like, like I knew that, and Dave and I uh, obviously sure. had done stuff there, right? Mm -hmm. And she allowed us to go there and be very candid with, you know, this wasn't race related, but it was mm -hmm. gallery related about how the gallery structure is just broken. So, and we were saying this in front of a crowd of people in which her and her husband, who are the owners of the gallery, so it takes a lot of self-awareness and, and courage and bravery to have two dudes come and skewer your model, right, from how galleries <laughs> operate. Sure. So, and this was you and Dave talking yeah. about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, um, so fast forward, you know, I had, not, I had known Sonia for like two or three years prior to uh, the Off the Plantation show. And I had come to her with an idea of, you know, allow me the trust to do something really different, or I want to engage people from an experience standpoint. I don't want it to be wine and cheese on a wall and mm -hmm. people come and there's a disconnect between what I create and the artist. I want this to be an immersive experience. I didn't know what that looked like, mm -hmm. but we were building out the blocks for it to be immersive. Like maybe have it be popped up in locations um, and the art kind of blur between, is it canvas on the wall or is it, is it, um, like, you know, let's just say we did it in a bodega, right? Like, mm -hmm. is, is part of the things I design, like, the packaging of the food and what, what am I telling in that story? So I want it to be this immersive sort of experience. And I had brought that to her, and we were building that out. And then uh, after we had done the Black Lives Matter mural, again, asking questions like, why did anyone need to see sort of a white-centric show during the height of the probably the biggest civil rights resurgence sure. that we had seen so that's when I hit up Dammit Wesley and I was like I can't do this show because it just doesn't feel right and that was the mm. authentic I'm like I don't I, I have but I have this platform and I have this gallery so what can y'all do to to like what can black market do can you enlist people to do something that's just going to send shockwaves through the city sure. and I want it to be as immersive and as as big as you want to, as big as you want to do it, mm -hmm. and I think, I I kid you not, within five minutes of that conversation, he said, "Let's call it off the plantation," and that's immediately when we started enlisting artists. So we had the first five artists within half an hour of conversation. We I had gone to I had the phone call that I had gone mm -hmm. to Camp North End, so we had enlisted the art the artist, and then we started going through. So we basically had a you know we had another meeting with Sonia at her house. Who are the, who are the artists that you invited? Will Jenkins, uh, obviously Dammit Wesley, Fart, Fart.pdf, um, Carla, and then Kiana, where okay, they were myself. Dope. And then we started having, fleshing out the ideas of how does this work? What does this look like? And we had, you know, four or five meetings, you know, at Sonia's house, at Black Market. We were kind of bouncing around, just figuring out what do the logistics of this look like? What does the experience look like? Mm -hmm. And going back to the, thing where like a number of times where I was like, yo, I don't feel comfortable being a part of this. Like, what is my role? Like, how do gotcha. I, this should be, again, I didn't want to be the flag bearer, right? Where I was like, white I'm guy. the white dude who's sure. doing everything. I was like, this is y'all thing. Like, sure. do it and let me just be a piece to the cog mm -hmm. where I can uh, just be a creative director. I didn't want to be showing art. Mm -hmm. And everything I created felt inauthentic because my aesthetic that I have doesn't fit kind of the narrative it, it just sure. didn't fit right so like I was struggling with the art creation part and that's when I that's when finally Dammit Wesley was like 
you know, again, I didn't even want this title either because that just also felt inauthentic. Was the the John Brown thing where he's like, you can be the John Brown of this huh. revolution, gotcha. where you're arming us, and because John Brown obviously broke into the arms and armed the slaves for the mm-hmm. revolt. He's sure. like, well, you're arming us with a platform. You're arming us with the art, to, you know, to to lead this revolt. And I was like, that. Anytime you attach yourself to something grandiose like that, it feel again feels inauthentic. It feels hmm. so. I always wanted to be a periphery, but they convinced me to just and assume that role and, and make it work. And one of the most important conversations I had was with Carla, and she was like, "You have to be the only white dude in the show, so you understand what it's like to be the only black person in the gallery." And you have to flip those roles because she, for her biggest thing was, I'm sick of being the token black person at art shows. Sure. The artist that everyone calls upon. So, you know, you can get like a taste of what it feels like to be at a place. That's when I started to flesh out, this is going to be more of a performance engaging Mm -hmm. piece than it is just art on a wall piece, which is where I came up with my two ideas for the show, um, which was the name tag that said... You know, like how they have name tags that say, like, hello, my name is? Sure. So, like, I had name tags for everyone that came in had to do, my great-grandfather was A, and that's when I started to want to challenge people, first of all, that were not that far removed from both slavery and indentured servitude. Sure. But also, I want white people to write, you know, dentists, politician, all these affluent jobs sure. so they can see where their head start comes from, right? Mm-hmm. And we're only, you know, 100 years removed from that. Sure. So I wanted people to come face to face. So if you're a white person and you have that on, to be like, damn, man, like, sure. and I wanted people to ha- not have these conversations behind a computer screen. Sure. So this idea of like, you're in a room now, you can't run from it. You have to have these conversations. Sure. You gotta be uncomfortable, ask questions. And so that was my first piece of performance art was the sticker. So having people have dialogue with people. Um, the second the second piece I had was a tally board um, with all of our names on it, and I wanted to tally who people came to talk to first as they entered the exhibit. Hmm. And the idea for that was, who are you most comfortable with? Like, if you're sure. white, are you coming to me first? Because you want to. It's like you're in an sure. exhibit that's supposed to make you uncomfortable, but you're coming to me. Sure. It's like finding the, fir- the only white person. Right. There. It's oh, like there you are. Why? No, I get it though. Like why? If you want to ask the questions, why are you asking me? There's mm. people here that experience uh. it every day. Go ask. Like go figure out what you know their perspective is sure. right so sure enough my tally board was just like you know mm-hmm. like to all the white people coming to talk to me was was that was sort of like a again performance based art less sure. aesthetic based art but I wanted to do more like getting into the minds of people and the third thing I had was a postcard that I would give people so if they had listened and talked to me long enough and asked the right questions I would give them a postcard that would bring them back for the second installment of the show because it was a two part show mm-hmm. and what John Brown did is he would go to taverns and churches and he would have, and I designed the postcard based off of one of his pamphlets, mm-hmm. where he would recruit people to be part of the revolt. And he would recruit, you know, like-minded, uh, you know, white people to be part of this revolution. So, mm-hmm. like, I was giving out postcards sort of, like, assuming this role of, like, come back to the second part. Sure. And the second part of the show was called The Emancipation, which was sort of, like, the first part was, you know, um, just, like, the... Uh, idea of being a slave to the gallery in a, mm-hmm. in a both met, metaphysical and physical way, but also in a um, non-literal uh, way, right? And then sure. the second part was the emancipation of, you know, being able to create as, an, as a black artist whatever it is you want to create, not bound by, like, white institutions, which... It's dope, man. Yeah, and again, it's good to hear the backstory. Again, yeah. people see the posts on social yeah. or read about it, but to know the backstory... And I, I'm a big advocate for, and I encourage as many of my white friends as possible where we have, again, the safety and authenticity to have this conversation that when it comes to issues of race, justice, and equality, um, because if you look at the DEI space or the diversity, equity, inclusion space, it's black and brown people, you know what I mean? And to a degree, it's like, no, to be able to, how would I say, be proximate to the issue yeah. and to speak into, okay, what needs to change makes perfect sense. But when it comes to what I'll call the, the passiveness of white individuals in being able, in activating themselves yeah. to do what you did with this gallery show is very rare. 
Um, and for various reasons, depending on the person, it may be something here, there, or wherever. But I believe it's super important that white artists, white bankers, white nonprofit leaders, white across the board, educate themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, who is John Brown? Right. Educate themselves as well as activate themselves yeah. when it comes to pretty much leveraging their privilege, um, not just in the general society, but also specifically within their own circles. Yeah. Um, because me as a black man saying something to a room full of white people, there's hurdles that they have to get over course, mentally. Yeah. Me being black, not knowing where I'm from, or assuming they know where I'm right, from because right. they've seen black people on television. Right. It's just so many hurdles to yeah. where for a white individual who's informed, culturally competent, understands the history of race in America, to have that conversation amongst those who look like them yeah. and have a lot in common, it's just you do away with a lot of those barriers, yeah. you know what I mean? As well as just from a receptive standpoint as well, it's mm -hmm. like, yo, I'm more willing to be authentic in front of you 100%. instead of a black or yeah. brown person, you know what I mean? So that's just, I think that's just a reality. So I think the more individuals like yourself, white individuals like yourself can do that, yeah. I think the impact or the pace of our progression when it comes to correcting some things that have been wrong, yeah could be very much amplified, oh, you know sure. what I mean? Yeah. So for yourself, obviously it was great to hear this story yeah. about off the plantation, how you are doing the work of what I consider being a bridge builder, creating opportunity and leveraging your influence to create those spaces and opportunities for those who might not have them. Yeah. You know and I mean, black and brown artists. Um, so I'm interested in, Honestly, how do you see yourself moving forward in doing more of that? Yeah. As well as how would you challenge other white artists um, to do something of that nature and bridge build within the art space? Sure. The number one thing is always being authentic about everything you do. It's got to come from a place of like, you know, the, it's got to come from a place of love and it's got to come from a place of you're doing it because you want to do the work and you're doing it in a selfless way. There's nothing that you can gain from this other than doing what's right and creating platforms and building bridges for people. Like that's the number one thing is, is and then the second part is building off the authenticity part is doing the work mm -hmm. and learning in a real and authentic way gotcha. and putting down all of your walls and barriers all the things as a white person that you've been taught, you know, in in a Eurocentric education system, sure. and learn and experience it, you know, in a way that's through um, more of the black and brown experience, and and that's it's got to come from a place of realness because you saw the the initial boom of like, you know, people when when George Floyd was murdered, of sure. like we all want to work, and then you just you <laughs> saw some cringy, cringy stuff that sure. you know may or may not have meant come from a place of well-meaning sure but like it's got to be done on it's your ill equipped ill equipped sure. yeah yeah you know what and that's the thing too is like being equipped for the task of the hand and it's like you're never gonna move that needle forward and build those bridges and if you're not doing it from a, a place mm. and it's work and as in there, that even makes me think about again even in trying to do good being aware of your privilege yeah you, you sit in, one can sit in such a position of privilege even when they want to do good, yeah. you expose your privilege yeah. by how you show up, 100%. you know what I mean? And that, again, just takes me to, again, while the world is in the streets, you know what I mean, yeah. post George Floyd, and again, whether it's you're there or watching television and there's just stories about and again, these are things that I understand from the dynamics yeah. of how I grew up. Where I grew up is just the reality of, and I'll just throw a, a, a scenario out there. It's like, well-meaning white person who's in the streets with me, yeah. you know what I mean? And how you show up and your privilege is dripping all over the place is not protecting me as a black right. man yeah. in that same street. But you have no idea because yeah. you've never had to have an idea yeah. that, you know what I mean? So it's like, I appreciate your intention, but the impact of you being here and being who you are unchecked yeah. is actually detrimental to what we're trying to accomplish sure. here, as well as just to me as a black man. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. no, that's 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 You have point. to have, as a white person, a lot of uncomfortable situations, but you have to put, you have to be humbled enough 
to put yourself to be humbled, right? Because sure. that's the that's how you're gonna learn. Is you you can't be defensive, and you you got to be like, oh, I messed up. I'm sure. in the wrong, right? And that takes a lot of humility and a lot mm -hmm. of like wanting to learn and get better. Because if you're the the privilege of being white is like we're always in a place of power and we're always in a place of like we're right everything sure. we say we we wrote the history books right we sure so it's like we're what do, what do you mean we're wrong what do you mean this experience is wrong <laughs> right. right you gotta let your guard down and, and be willing to have uncomfortable conversations as well as you know like you said do your own research and do sure. your own work so i think that you know a, a, a lot of people that i know that are well-meaning are ill-equipped for a number of reasons mm -hmm. but no so uh, i would love the so you talk about your work with Sonia yeah. um, in the Elder Gallery. I think that was a good example. We didn't talk, talk much about your conversation that you and Dave had, yeah. but if you could, again, challenge those who own gallery, the system of art, sure. um, the Eurocentric base in which it, it has and still does exist sure. on, how would you challenge even a gallery owner right. in creating bridges and changing the way that looks right now? Um, well, the, the 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 model of a gallery is broken to begin with because it's based on elitism and selling to your elite friends, right? Mm -hmm. So you've already it's it's like, hey, let's invite all of our elite, you know, affluent people here mm -hmm. to look at the people that we have co-signed. So it's a very sure. like nepotism, Got which you. in itself in America is very white centric sure. nepotism and sort of like inherit inheriting like privilege, right? So I would say. It can't just be like, you know, you're gonna have a show with black people in it. It's like the show, the entire show from top to bottom, you just gotta let, <laughs> relinquish all control of everything. Yeah. Anything that needs to be said, even about the gallery owner, needs to be said, and you need to take that head on. So sure. if they're gonna, you know. You it, know what I call that? What? I call that sharecropping. Oh, is the idea that oh, yeah, I yeah, can yeah, run yeah. this. Yeah. I'll let you, you know. Yeah, come on exactly, in, exactly. Bring people in, you know what I mean? And I've experienced that that again concept within the music realm, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Being the black rapper guy in these white spaces like again, I I know my purpose, which is why I show up, sure. you know what I mean? Do what I what I do as a bridge builder, but at the same time the the aspect of not knowing that Unless you relinquish control, uh, all control. and empower yeah. others, you yeah. know what I mean, that don't have control, sure. you're pretty much it's sharecropping. Yeah, you still control, exactly. you still hold the strings. Mm -hmm. You're just giving. Yeah, you can go ahead and do that. You, yeah, 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 okay. You, yeah, you can put it up there. And, you know, not in our main gallery space, right. but it's along the way as people yeah. walk to the main gallery. We could do that. It's like cool, right? But it's there's the, so much more oh, that it's needs the bare to be minimum. done. Exactly. And it's like, the thing I loved about what Sonia was doing was it was like, it was complete and utter, like the most... Top to bottom. Yeah, and it was a, a lot of really... I mean, the first white dude who came to that show mm -hmm. came to me. And we had invited people from all different backgrounds because we mm -hmm. wanted we wanted to have... You're not going to have a conversation with another, like, you know, woke white person. They're just, they're there to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm a part of this, right? But you, yeah. we want to have a conversation with those extreme right wing, you know, supporters. So the mm -hmm. first guy who came to me was an, like, you can tell he had this more right extreme views on, mm -hmm. on, on everything. So he comes in and his wife are there and, you know, very like confrontational. He comes right to me, obviously, because mm -hmm. I'm the only white dude. And he's like, he said something along the lines like, who are you? What are you doing? And then he said, and I was like, well, you know, I'm, I, I would assume <laughs> the role weird. of John Brown. And he's like, oh, so you're a terrorist. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, and that's yeah. the first conversation I had. And I was like, well, what makes you think that? And he's like, he's like, you are toppling a system that has been set for decades. Like, but the system in his mind was right, right? So as me, as I'm breaking down the, the walls or build, building bridges, right? Mm -hmm. he, his comfort and his space of probably affluent and privileged, mm -hmm. right, was being challenged. So it was, and that's who you want to talk to, right? And we never got, we never got through to him, obviously. He, yes. and I was the least shocking of, of like, you know, of everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, but when they left, we gave people a chance to write on post-it notes how they felt, because mm -hmm. we wanted to know how people felt. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they just wrote completely disconnected. We did not get it, you know? And it's like, if you come here and you don't get it, that's on you. There's so much to get, right? And I don't see that as a bad thing. Right. So. For me, again, in my own journey, and I just believe this around 
Uh, again, building authentic relationships across the difference. Just giving someone the opportunity yeah, is the true. first step. True. Because again, we live these siloed lives where we never have to cross paths, yeah. you know what I mean? And if we do, it's like strangers in the night. It's like, yeah. I don't really see you. So even, again, the fact that this exhibit happened and individuals like this man and probably others had the opportunity to even be in the space, sure. I believe is a it's a step, you yeah, know what I mean? Of course. It shouldn't be seen as ah, whatever. Right. Yeah, you know, you definitely really profound like, point. Yo. Yeah. The fact that he even came, you know, and like got himself in there like mm -hmm. uh is 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 really it's it's really a profound um sort of uh way to look at it, you know? And I and I'm I was so upset because he left cuz we had put so our heart and soul into it. So I was <laughs> sure. emotionally attached to it. Sure. So, but you're just you're you have an outsider's perspective, but sure. you're like, and I was like, man, like, no, I get it. It's like you want to change him, for sure. I was like, man, we, we put everything in this, and that's all you got from it. And it's no. like, I was so mad. But yeah, that's a really profound the fact that he came, engaged, and again, everything's done behind computer screens and phones mm -hmm. now. We're disconnected from people. Sure. A lot of the things that people would say behind the screen, and it, whether it be hateful or whatever, is, is ch challenged and changed when you're looking at another human being in the eye sure. and you have more empathy and you have sure. more the ability to want to be more understanding. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, that, I, yo, so, and I'll speak about myself because I think rarely do you hear examples about, again, just the, the black experience in that same dynamic. Yeah. Um, so, and it's just bias. Yeah. And a lot of it's just implicit. You don't even know you have it bias. Yeah. So with me even moving to Charlotte, again, whole 180, black cultural upbringing, low income. That is my upbringing, first 19 years of my life. Coming to Charlotte, south side of Charlotte, Ballantyne, Pineville area, 180 flip. Um, and I remember uh, just putting, and this is my, my cousin's word, so he, again, he's been here for years, majority of his friends white, Yeah. you know, they're going to play ball, I love playing ball, you right. know what I mean, it's me and my younger brother here, but he didn't invite us, you mm. know what I mean, and after the, after he came back, I asked him, why are you invite us, man, you know, we want to play ball, yeah. and he felt, and it's probably not his word exactly, but I sum it up, I believe he felt we would make it awkward mm. for him around his white friends mm. um whether it's through what we said how we acted xyz yeah and again very much in retrospect the more i was able to build relationships with others white guys yeah, yeah, yeah. brown etc across the board gender difference etc i was able to understand that that tension for him is real yeah. you know what i mean i can't take that away from him but at the same time i could also understand how I was probably carrying some baggage mm. that made me show up in a way mm. because of my perception about white people. Yeah, you know what I mean? Of course, yeah. And how I voiced that, how I moved around that, I could see how that could be put him in a difficult position yeah. as well as potentially be offensive sure. to the white individuals yeah. that you're playing ball with, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, again, flipping the table is like, yo, we all exist with this ingrained yeah. history of existence, bias which the majority are not based in fact of, oh, I actually have a relationship with them. Right, it's yeah. like from afar, them, you yeah. know what I mean? And mm -hmm. they, you know what I mean? So I believe we all exist with that, sure. that but the ability to call it into check is yeah. the difference. It's like, do I know that about myself? Okay, right. let me call it in check. I don't know this person, so let me, let me exist with them based on them as an individual right. rather than I know people to be, you know of what I mean? Of course, yeah. But real quick to, I mean, if I heard you correctly about the gallery owners in that space, is your your advice would be explore removing your hands fully and empowering oh, others completely. from top to bottom. Completely. Relinquish all control. If you truly want right, exactly. to shift the way the art world yeah. exists, the gallery space exists. Of course, yeah. Got it. Um, well, inherently, the gallery system is a dying model, so it's already, like, behind the eight ball in terms of like what it needs it does it needs to do a lot of things like mm -hmm. to to revive what it is and because of social media sure. like you know without getting too deep into it the gallery is about our art world is like 
10 or 15 years behind the music world, right? So gotcha. artists have been able to relinquish control through platforms like Spotify streaming, and yeah. streaming and, and Napster and even the early days of LimeWire and stuff, right? Well, Instagram, TikTok, and NFTs are now uh, removing the power from galleries gotcha. in, a, in a digital space. So galleries are already trying to play catch up because we no longer need a brick and mortar to survive. Gotcha. Whereas they know, you know, like just like the musician is, they don't need a record label surviving, sure. anymore, right? So, but if you want to, I don't know what it looks like to create a new experience. Like I'm not a gallery owner, but if you are gonna do a show and you're gonna do it the right way, you have to relinquish all control from top to bottom. And now that's not to say like, if you have, it's a lot of grayer, but if you have like a brand guidelines, it's important to be as a, as a, someone who's a creative director to want to create where, you know, an example would that be like, don't say what can go on or off the wall. Don't mm -hmm. say what people can wear. Because again, a lot of the structure is yeah. a very European structure of sure. suit and tie, wine and cheese, right? If you want to break the bridges or you want to build the bridges and break down the walls, the entire experience from top to bottom has to be relinquished control. Now, well, like that's where I struggled too, which is why I didn't participate in the second part of Off the Plantation. I removed myself and I think, you know, I feel like people were upset with me like, but I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't, it didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And no one was telling me that it didn't feel right. And I was like, I had to remove myself because it mm -hmm. feels too forced and it doesn't feel like we have the messages there. Mm -hmm. So like as a, as an artist and as a gallery owner, remove yourself. Like if gotcha. you have to remove yourself because it doesn't feel right, stop attaching yourself sure. to it because you want to be a part of it. Right. Sure. So I think that the biggest thing is just the relinquishing of control and um, from top to bottom, from everything. No, I feel that, man. I feel that. Luke, this has been good, man. Yeah. Um, great to hear the story and honestly just how you process through your movements. Um, I personally think it's a good way to process um, sure. and pretty much be a John Brown within the space as you can. Yeah. Um, I would definitely encourage you, man, keep, keep moving. And even where it makes you uncomfortable, yeah. like you don't exist, I think to your uh, encouragement or challenge of galleries owners is like, yo, this may be where you need to trust right. um, someone else, you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Um, Cause just in knowing who you are, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's like, there's probably things that you've internalized that keep you from doing what you could do. Right, you yeah. get what I'm saying? So, yeah, 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 yeah. But no, this, is, this has been dope, man. Yeah, thank I you. appreciate yeah, it. I appreciate the opportunity. Indeed, and before we wrap, man, I have a gift for you. Oh. Um, I was, man, I was looking at this the whole conversation. <laughs> I'm like, am I going to be able to look at this? This is Bridge Builder Motivational Journal, man. This has 52. It's a signed and autographed version nice. for you, my guy. Um, but 52 weeks oh, of wow. motivational quotes as well as reflection and action items when it comes to these quotes. So they all revolve around bridge Whoa. building. Um, all 52 of my quotes and just and my intention is how can I encourage yeah. a, a slew of people, a movement of people who are truly interested in doing this work. Yeah. Um, and I think just like we're conditioned to do anything, it's okay, it's consistency. How do I cons consistently think about these things, challenge myself to yeah. not just mentally move, but also with your hands and feet move how, how, this, how this world looks through your efforts, man. So Thank hey man, you. I appreciate this for for real. Like this is um, the human, as human beings, the the digital landscape is really removing our intimacy with one another, and it's putting us behind more non-intimate moments. So mm -hmm. the fact that we can have these conversations is is the catalyst for how things change and move things forward. So like, you know, yeah. this is um, this is really important. I think not to be grandiose, but it's important not just for like this moment in time, but sure. people to look back on and be like, you know. You know, we're gonna be like a like a, a grain of sand in mm -hmm. the, in the the time, the time thing, right? Sure. You know what I mean. So for people to look back on this, this is sort of the conversations that they're gonna look at to be like, this is this is the beacon of what we need to look to to how to move things forward, not just through like the more casual stuff like art and music, but like you know, in terms of how we relate to each other from different races and different um, genders and sexual backgrounds. And it's something that I, I'm really passionate about and I wanna, I love digital landscape. I love the digital space, but I also think that, you know, conversation is so important and, in, and sure. breaking down barriers and building bridges starts with a face-to-face -face conversation, humility, 
letting your guard down and being like empathetic towards the other person mm -hmm. and being real and also you know not being afraid like i said to to make a mistake because mm -hmm. like that's how you're going to learn you know absolutely man you make me think about the bridge builder values are safety yeah humility authenticity and camaraderie yeah I believe if we have those, and I believe we're doing a number of them right now in our conversation, but as we move together in sync in the various spaces we exist, in the art world, me, music, um, as a coach, in my consulting, is like, if there's, if we're aligned, I believe the movement can be more effective. Yeah. Um, so, but it takes, it takes this, it takes that relationship. Sure. So, appreciate you, man. Yeah. Enjoyed it, man. Thank you, thank you. Indeed.